Well, welcome to Tea Time, guys. That's right, Miss Liz is back. And yes, it is a Monday, so you know what that means. It's a surprise tea time. And I have the returning incredible John Kellis in the back waiting to serve a second cup of tea with you guys tonight. So before we start our tea time tonight, we're going to get you over to Miss Liz's YouTube channel, ring that little doorbell, and you can watch these tea times at any time, morning, afternoon, or evening. If you hear Miss Liz's voice a little crackle, yes, I have still a little cold that I'm getting over, so... Please excuse that little crackle in the voice. Uh, so we're going to get the disclaimer out. We're going to get a little bit of bio out, and we're going to get John in here. Tonight's tea is survival is revival. That's right. We're serving different type of tea in Miss Liz's house. We don't serve a beverage. We serve real life stories and words. And we're going to be talking about John's book, um, When the Rain Stops, and a little bit of updates since he's been on tea time last time and, and shooting and, and get some other stuff out there for all of you guys out there. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the section. I'll get those out to John as well during our live broadcast. And if you would like to stay anonymous, you can send them directly to Miss Liz's uh, Facebook page and DM me and I'll get those questions out to John if they're related to the conversation. Disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time Live show. Miss Liz, myself, is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forth dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing. All Tea Time guests and, and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment and taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content might be brought forward may include discussions for, for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It is significant to know that this show is engaging in discussion forums only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutic advice. If you have any questions about this disclaimer or the panel's discussion, you may freely contact me, Miss Liz, through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in tonight's show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that the show is not made for you at this time, I respect those wishes and will see you at a later show at a later date in time. And again, all tea time shows are done on Thursday. That's the original date, 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you see it on a Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, it's a surprise special or rescheduled tea time. So now a little bit about John. Well, I'm going to keep it short and sweet, and then we're going to get John in here. And we're going to spill some tea. So John has worked 50 years, a remarkable 50 year career in the entertainment industry. John has directed and produced award-winning films, commercials, and television shows. His extensive experiences include work with uh, iconic actors, and notable projects that have shaped the industry from featuring films like no solicitors to adapting best-selling novel john's storytelling probably is unmatched he also has a bunch of other things that you can check out i on, on on my facebook page his full bio is there and let me get john in here let me sip on some of my medicine over here that miss liz is drinking hi john hello miss liz how are you I don't know, man. I started getting all tongue twisted there. I don't know what the heck was going on with me there, but <laughs> so welcome back, John. Thank you. So John, for all the listeners who haven't seen you on season four, tell us a little bit on who you were as a little guy and who you are now. Well, who I am now is a 50 um, year veteran filmmaker with uh, eight award winning productions, including an Emmy nomination, uh, written six books, um, and I've really enjoyed the, the whole process of being a filmmaker. Who I was as a little boy, however, is a different story. Uh, I lost my dad at three and uh, pretty much gave up hope, felt abandoned, uh, frustrated with the world. And by the time I was 12, I was acting out so badly that uh, the courts gave my mother a choice of either sending me to military school or reform school. 
the hindsight, I might have been chosen, choosing a reform school because a military school didn't do me any good. So they took me out of there. And by the time I was 15, I had had it with life. I completely depressed. And one night I walked to the edge of the dock where there was a little frozen lake and jumped in, uh, wanting to kill myself. And um, somehow underwater, the cold got to me and I thought, there's got to be a better way. And so I started to accept help and mentorship and therapy and turn my life around. So John, John, when you were on season four last year, we talked about your book that you wrote, the memoir. Do you want to share a little bit about that book? Because I really want to get the book out again tonight. Sure. It's, um, it's a journey from a, a young boy um, that has a perspective as a little boy that is quite different than the adult looking back at it. So there are two voices in the book. The, the little boy, which I had to rip band-aids off and scars and everything else to get down to telling the truth about how I felt as that little boy without tainting it, looking at it from an adult. So I would explain what I was going through. I would experience it with the audience reading it. And then there's a great section that the adult would look back and see the truth of what the misconception of the truth was when I was a little boy. And uh, from there, it went through my entire life, um, the career as a filmmaker, and uh, to this day, basically, it's 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 a journey from ghetto to a very successful uh, filmmaker. Yeah, because I believe that's what I did last year when you were on was ghetto to Hollywood, right? Right. That's it. <laughs> so let's talk about the ghetto because people look at the ghetto in different ways. So let's talk about the ghetto. Well, Jersey City back in uh, in the early fifties was a very rough place. If you weren't a neighborhood kid, you'd get the snot beat out of you. It was uh, a very mixed environment, both whites and African-Americans. And um, unless they knew you, uh, you did, it wasn't safe to walk around. Um, there were junkyards. There were you know fights breaking out. We would have mud fights, and people would start putting rocks in the mud and throwing at each other. So you'd walk away bloody and everything else. And uh, it was just a very tough life. There was no forgiveness in it. So, John, as a little boy, you mentioned that you went to military school, right? Yes. So how was it for you there? The worst three years of my life. Now, before I get into it, I have to admit, at that age, I had a mouth on me. Not that I don't know, but at that point, I didn't have any filters. So the first night I arrived in military school, I literally got knocked out three times. Uh, no one had explained the rules to me. I didn't want to be there. I was 12 years old. I had just traveled from New York City to Virginia alone, no parents, nothing. And I was scared to death. So my survival instinct kicked in to be a smart ass and it wasn't a good move. Now, the disclaimer here is I hated it. I hated every minute, but there were kids that went to that school that were setting themselves up for West Point, Annapolis and all the other things because they wanted to be career military people. And for them, God bless them. You know, we need people like that. It just was the wrong fit for me. So I fought a tooth and nail and got into all sorts of trouble. Um, I managed to set a school record of getting the most demerits in the first semester that any kid has ever had. And a demerit meant that every hour of free time, you couldn't have it until that demerit was taken off your record. So I would either march or have to do exercises on all my free time, and it just drove me mad. So how do you look at military, John, in today's world? I think it's, it's necessary. Um, I'm proud that both my fathers, my deceased father and my stepfather served in the armed forces. I have nothing but respect for the armed forces and the veterans. And um, I can't say enough good things about them. It's just not a fit for me. I'm, I'm not that personality. Yeah. So John, your story, it's called When the Rain Stops, correct? Yes. So why do you, why that title for your book? That's an interesting question because I am, um, I was outside one day and it was raining and it was like a double edged sword. There was a lot of pain going into my heart and I always felt the rain was pouring into my heart, but the rain also represented to me a washing of wet, you know, wave of uh, frustrations, trauma, anxiety. So I thought when the rain stops, what happens? Well, the clouds disperse and the sun comes out. So it was very transformational in, in the concept of when the rain stops. 
so John, when I, when I hear that title, when, I, when, when you gave me the book and I read the book and I was like, whoa, like, you, you know, when you came and asked me to be on Tea Time, I said, okay, let me read your book. It really took me back because men's stories need to be heard, right? Yes. And that's what I got when I read your book was that you were giving a voice to that little boy that didn't have a voice growing up. So, John, by sharing your story, have you opened doors for other men to share their stories? I have, actually. And um, just sidestep back to the military thing. A, a veteran actually reached out to me and said, I read your book. And I have to say, it really helped me as a veteran because he had PTSD. And he saw what I had gone through and realized what he was going through. And it gave an opportunity for him to have his own voice. He said he was scared to death to talk about his problems. And so we communicated back and forth by email, and I encouraged him to be safe enough in your own heart and secure enough that what you say is honest and nobody can take that away from you. And if anyone tries to, then you walk away from them because you don't need that in your life. So I think what it has done is it's given the opportunity for men to realize when we grew up, crying wasn't acceptable. It was, you know, you don't cry, you're a man, you, yeah. you know, smacked upside the head if you cried. And now men are finally saying, well, wait a minute, we have feelings, we have emotions, it's okay to express those feelings. And it's okay to have emotions. I mean, I never saw my father cry, but my kids have seen me cry. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it's hopefully giving some security to men to be able to come forth and not be afraid of their own feelings. And also in your book, you shared about your mental illness as well, John. So let's talk about that. Sure. Well, uh, you can imagine losing a father at three and being um, in a position where you f felt abandoned. I went into such a spiral that I was depressed all the time. I didn't think anything in the world was going to work for me. I hated the world. Uh, it seemed to hate me. Every time I turned around, I had created situations of my own doing, mind you, um, that would come back to, to punch me in the face, basically. And that would validate my depression and my feelings that, you know, screw the world. Uh, you know, this isn't for me. I hate everything. And it was the worst place you could be in. But oddly enough, when I found myself sitting alone, and I could be in a crowd of thousands, but I was still alone. If nobody was around me, I knew or I had to deal with anything. There was a safety factor there. I felt okay. So I found peace and quiet within my own depression. And that I later learned was the worst thing I could have done and the mo most difficult thing to come out of. So that's a very dangerous place to be. Uh, the depression took hold of me so deeply that everything that happened to me, I felt was because of other people and other people were doing this to me. And I had to change my mindset and get therapy to get out of that. Well, I think with depression, with a lot of people, right? We, it's easier to blame everybody else, right? Than working on ourselves um you know and it lives within us like the depression's in us it's not in others you know uh when we talk about depression in today's world do you think that we're speaking about it enough john i think we're beginning to i don't think we're, we're speaking enough about it but i do think we are beginning to uh, an interesting fact that most people don't know is the cdc came out with a study said every adult person in america will experience at least one major depressive episode in their lives. Now, what I encourage people to understand is it may not be lifelong. It may be a one day episode, but try to remember how you felt during that episode. So when you run into somebody who, who is seemingly depressed, you understand a little bit more about that process and not make a funny joke about it because it's not, it's a serious item. Um, so I do think the more people that talk about it, others feel, well, if they can talk about it, maybe it's safe enough for me to talk about it. Uh, and that's what I try to help people with is, is feeling safe enough to tell their story and have a voice. Well, John, you're also an advocate for mental health, right? Yes. So do you do like uh, conferences and seminars and stuff like that? To I do. And I do one-on-ones. I mean, I have people from, uh, 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 Instagram uh, reached out to me. A woman reached out to me and said, can I talk to you? And I called her and we spent about an hour and a half on the phone. And when I got on the phone, she was crying and she was telling me all about what was going on in her life. 
And now I'm not a licensed therapist, so I don't give advice. What I do do is pose questions and offer from my own life experience what's happened to me. And so to me, it's really the value about that person you're speaking with, not about my experience. So the more we talked, the more she opened up and the more she became lighter and lighter until she started laughing at the end. And she said, I gotta thank you because my mom passed away, but everything you've told me, I feel like she uh, channeled through you. And when I got off the phone, I felt really, really happy that I made such a difference in a human being's life. And hopefully she'll take that and spread it to the next person. And then two people will spread it to four, four will spread it to eight. And eventually we'll get there where we can understand what the process is and what people go through without judgment. Well, one thing I want everyone to understand, like all my listeners tonight, you know, John is an everyday person too. You know, John, he, you have all the titles, John, but that's what I really liked about you is when you reached out to me, it was person to person, you know, it wasn't title to title. It was, I see you, I see you. Like, you know what I mean? And yeah. I think that's what we need to have is those conversations is like you said, like woman reached out to you and right away you gave her the time where the misconception is people that work in Hollywood and that they're too busy for conversations. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't agree with that in terms of being too busy. If you're too busy to reach out to another human being or help them, I don't want to know you. It, yeah. I mean, you don't have value in life in my opinion. And, that, and, and that's what I really liked about our friendship because we've become really good friends and supported each other through the journey since we've met each other, you know? Uh, and John, you mentioned this lady reaching out to you about her mom. How was your relationship with your mom? It was very tumultuous at the beginning, naturally, because when she dropped me off at the train station in New York and turned away, I really felt like she abandoned me and hated me. It wasn't until years later when we finally got to talking and I told her that and she started crying. She said, honey, the reason I turned away is I was putting my little 12 year old boy on a train by himself and I was just crying my eyes out and it just like, holy I realized at that point, the perception of that three or the 12 year old getting on that train was so different than what the truth really was. She yeah. actually saved my life by, by doing it. it. I can't imagine, I looked at my kids at 12 and I could not imagine putting them on a train at 12, but she had the strength to know, had she not done that, God only knows what would happen in my life. It would not have been the way it is today. So uh, yeah. we made amends and I, I adored that woman. I mean, we talked every day and, uh, my wife would always say, did you call your mother today? I said, I could not call her. Of course I did. So uh, we had a good relationship. All my friends uh, loved my mom. Some were scared of her, but they still loved her. <laughs> <laughs> and you share that in the book. That's what I really like is the relationship you shared in the book. And you're, the book is so easy to read. It was a, not like a book where I'm going to read two or three pages and put it down. It was an easy flow read. A really, in like there was a lot of hard stuff in the book, but I found it was an easy read to read um, as somebody who had went through trauma herself, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I really get a lot out of reading other people's stories that deal with trauma and mental illness because you don't feel such alone, right? No. Um, and I really liked the title. Like when, when you reached out and you gave me the book, I was just, oh, when the rain stops. And I like to stand in the rain because that's nobody can see me cry when I'm in the rain, right? Or yeah. I like to take a shower and cry in the shower. Nobody sees that. Uh, so that's what I got when I seen the cover of your book. I was like, oh, this is a cry. This is going to be a crier. I'm going to I'm going to cry with this one. That's funny because a friend of mine read When the Rain Stops. And he called me and says, I didn't realize this was like such an intense book. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, I read your horror movie and, and your book, and um, I thought this was another horror movie, and I started getting into it. And I said, well, actually, it might have been a little bit of a horror movie in there. <laughs> so it's, it, it's, um, it's interesting how people look at a title and get different things out of it. Yeah, and the cover of it, too, is almost like the rainbow, right? Like the rainbow coming out, like the colors that are on the top. Uh, so how did you get the cover for that book, John? Well, I went through a million different ideas. I had one idea where I was, a, a figure was silhouetted against the background of uh, the ocean and stuff, and it just didn't read right. And then I spoke to my editor um, and he said, I have a thought for you. I said, what? He says, the rain, the ocean, the clouds, and all that means a lot to you. Why don't we just do an ocean scene with the sunset and the clouds representing that it's 
it's like the phoenix coming out of the ashes. You know, the clouds are separating. There's life. There's light. There's love. And I thought, wow. And when he presented that to me, I just fell in love with the cover. I, I think it's absolutely stunning. So everybody should go over and check it out, like grab a copy, you know, and pass it along. Uh, you know, when you buy a book and you read the book and you're done with the book, pass it along to somebody else. I always tell people, keep passing it, right? Pay it forward. Um, and the story gets out there as well. I have a great idea. Instead of passing along, buy them one. Right? <laughs> Christmas <laughs> gifts. Christmas is coming, right? <laughs> what are we? Like, I, I should have reached out to Santa before I came on to find out how many days before Christmas. I, I think it's a little 80 days or something like that. I'm not sure. Santa's going to be Miss Liz. <laughs> <laughs> See, Miss Liz has friends all over. I even have Santa Claus that gets after me, get off the naughty list once in a while. Uh, so, uh, John, I want to talk about your tea tonight because you gave me something that's totally different. Uh, survival is revival. Why those three words? Well, if you're going to survive in this world, in my opinion, you have to break it down to where you're at. And the only way is the revival part is to first understand where you're at in life and take responsibility for it and say, you know, this is what I did. This is who I am. And everything around me is because of the way I've made it so. So if you're going to survive, you have to take the horn, uh, the bull by the horns and revive your own life. You've got to say, I want to change my life. It's a blank piece of paper. I'm going to write my own movie. And here's how the story goes. And here's the middle of it. And here's hopefully the end to it. And then you have to day by day move towards your vision of what your revival is. And once you do that, you start to begin to survive and you start breathing easier and you, the weight of the world comes off your shoulder. You're not so consumed by all the little things that nitpick at you and your brain starts to relax and you start to hear things and don't turn away from them. If something says, nin, 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 listen to it and then, then smack it, say, no, that's not how we're going to do it. Uh, for an example, um, someone the other day said to me, oh, I can't afford that. And I said, stop right there. He said, what? And I said, let's change your mindset. I said, what do you mean? I said, that comment makes you a poor person inside, mentally, spiritually, and physically too. And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, look at the difference. I can't afford it. He goes, right? As opposed to, I have to find out a way to make more money so I can buy it. And he looked and went, damn, that's good. <laughs> and I said, well, it's just a matter of training your brain to see things to be able to survive. And by doing so, you revive your spirit, you revive who you are, and you revive everything around you because once you change your mindset, different people may be coming into your life and others that were damaging and less supportive leave your life. And once you see the process makes you healthier, you have now survived by revival. I love that. You know, I never looked at it that way. Because I get into those spots too, right? Those downers, and I'm just like, oh, I can't do this. And then I hate the word can't. And then I try to break it up, right? Cannot. And then it's, I can, you know, it's reprogram reprogramming ourselves, you know, and seeing different perspectives. And that's why I like having these open conversations with you, John. Uh, you know, it's because you're giving me a, a different way of looking at life. You know, even before we went live, there was a couple things, and now, us having this conversation, I'm just like, ah, I got it. Uh, yeah. You know, it clicks in and we have to have these conversations in order to open up, uh, you know, new paths and new ways of thinking and understanding. Um, and it goes right back to the depression, right? Mental illness, understanding it by having conversations and talking about it. Um, and I'm glad that you brought it up that one in four, one in four, you know, yeah. for the, for the major depression, because it makes everyone out there understand that it can affect all of us. You know? And it does affect all of us. Everyone will have a major depressive episode. It doesn't mean you're mentally unstable or anything. It just means you've broken down. And it's, yeah. it's the old Chinese proverb, you have to empty the glass before you can fill it up again. That's what I think some of this tends to be. And if you're strong enough and think it out enough, it's good once in a while to empty it out because you can't stay at the top plateau. So you have to empty it in order to revive it again and, and build some more stuff and not be afraid to do it. 
And once you get that process, you start embracing it. You go, okay, when, what's the next one? What's the next one? And you start feeling good. And then when you see that you're affecting other people's lives, it just gives you this over, well, it get, I won't speak for everyone, I'm sorry. It gave me this overwhelming sense that I'm making a contribution to make this world better, more filled with love and less filled with hate. Yeah. So John, do you remember the first tea you served me? Yes. You do? I do. What is it? I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> You're not even going to let it spill a little? <laughs> okay. It's uncover, discover, and recover. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised you remember. That's good. I like that. Yeah, I'm, I I'm, haven't burned all the brain cells yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, let's talk about a little bit about Hollywood because all of my listeners out there, they got some questions here for Hollywood. So oh. how did you get into it? How, old how did I get into it? Ooh, um, I was doing my master's degree at Occidental College, and I was sitting in a little shop and uh, a, a restaurant, and I was doing my uh, work. And I heard everyone giggling, and I looked over, and there was a, a bald-headed guy with a white suit on. Everyone was laughing and pointing at him. And he caught my eye, and I smiled at him, and I went back to work. Next thing I know, guy sat next to me. He says, what are you doing? I said, well... I'm blocking out this play that I have to do as part of my master thesis. And he said, can I come see it? I said, oh, yeah, it's going to be open to the public. So he came. And I, I, at that point in my life, and I still don't do this, I wasn't the kind of guy that says, hi, my name's John. What do you do for a living? You know, everyone's trying to find a way to make a connection. Yeah. To me, it was all about the person, not the connection. So about six months in, into our friendship, I finally said, hey, what do you do for a living? He goes, oh, I'm an art director in the film business. I said, oh, really, Is that, that sounds interesting. Tell me about it. And he did. And he goes, you sound like you're interested in film. I said, well, theater is not where I want to be. I want to be a filmmaker. I did a class in filmmaking. And he said, well, let me see if I can get you on a set. So one morning at 3 o'clock in the morning, he brought me on a set, told me where to stand, and said, if you stand here, nobody will bother you. If they do, tell them I like said it was okay. So this old crumply cut comes walking and goes, what are you doing here? And I thought, oh, God, 15 minutes on the set, I'm going to get thrown off. He, and I told him who was he. He said, all right, come with me. So it brings me into a band, and he starts having me wrap this thing called primer cord. Well, it turns out it was an explosive, so I jumped out of the van. I said, are you nuts? I don't know anything about this. He goes, nah, you could burn it. You have to set it off with a special cap and a lot. Turns out he was uh, the stuntman from the original hunch, Hunchback of Notre Dame. And so he liked me, and he took me under his wing, so I started learning how to blow people's brains up and blow up cars and, you know, fun stuff that really got a lot of the crap out of me. And uh, then it went dead again, and I took a job uh, parking cars on a film set. And from there, you know, something else happened, and then it went dead again. And I took an employment uh, job where I was placing people, and I hated Then I became a waiter. And a friend walked in and said, what are you doing as a waiter? You want to be a prop master? And I said, sure, I don't know anything about it. So I got on that set, and uh, one thing led to another, and the director liked me, so I became the dialogue director because I told him, the actors were having the wrong dialect. And he listened because, you know, you're right. And then from there, he asked me to become an assistant director and things started evolving. And I made a choice though, Liz, and if anyone out there wants to be a filmmaker, don't get stuck in any one area. Don't just do commercials. Don't just do music videos. Spread yourself out because when one dies, you have another to rely on. And that's, I, I became an every person, you know, an expert in so many areas that I was able to work all the time and build a, a very lucrative career that way. Yeah, because if you want to stay in one section, when that section dies off, then what do you do, right? Exactly. Yeah. And I think it's really important that, uh, you know, that we show everybody that it took you steps to get to where you are today. You know, it wasn't something you just flick the light on and boom, Hollywood director. You, no. you know, there was a there was a journey and a story behind it. Um, John, I want to talk to you about Bobby's world. Hmm. How did you get involved with that? Well, um, I got a call from a friend that says, you got to call this company because they need help. I called up and they said, oh, you're the guy that uh, was recommended. I said, right. He says, well, we want to marry a cartoon with the live action, but I said, you did it wrong, didn't you? They said, yeah, we went, we shot it backwards. Is there any way to fix it? I said, yeah, there's a way to fix it. It's going to be a little expensive, but there's a way to fix it. 
And so I explained the process to them and they said, all right, how much is it going to cost? I did a budget and they, they approved it. And after the shoot, a couple of days later, the, um, the producer from the company calls me and says, uh, I just got off the phone with the editors and I'm sitting there going, oops, okay, what's up? He said, they're in love with you. They want to kiss you. They're, everything matched. It was all eye lines were perfect and everything. And um, Would you like to do a couple more episodes? I said, sure, I'd love to. That turned into 80 episodes and an Emmy nomination. So <laughs> you just don't know where it's going. So what is the, the, the range for episodes in a series, John? What's the what? Like, what's the range for episodes in series, like TV series and that? Like, is it 12 episodes? Is it 100 episodes? How many episodes for one season? There's really no hard and fast rule. Um, what they were doing is giving me, like, four shows to do at a time. And so I would go in and I would direct all the live action against green screen and Howie Mandel and I would talk about what we're doing and we would uh, get through four shows. And then a couple of weeks later, we'd do another four shows and a month later, we'd do another four shows. And, and it just kept going until 80 shows later, we had it all done. Wow. So for anybody that doesn't know who Bobby's World is, do you wanna share a little bit about that? John? Sure. It's a, a show that Harry Mandel created called Bobby's World, in which there's a cartoon character called Bobby, and he interacts with Howie, the live action uh, Howie, and they go through these little episodes of, you know, the adventures and all that. And it's, it's a very cute, uh, cool show. It's funny because sometimes when I'm on set, somebody goes, wait a minute, you did Bobby's World? I grew up with that. And I'm like, oh, God, you're making me feel old. <laughs> I won't say it then. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> August is my 50th year in the entertainment business. So I guess at some point you do get a little older. <laughs> yeah. So John, on, on your, on your flyers that I, I shared for tea time, I also shared two other books that you uh, wrote, uh, the solicitor and secrets. So let's talk a little bit about those books because those books really grabbed my attention too. Good. Um, well, I'll, I'll give you the short version on no solicitors. Um, I have a sign on my door that says no solicitors. So when people ring the doorbell and they're soliciting, it just drives me mad. So one day I was having lunch with a friend of mine at Warner Brothers, and he said, you seem like you're in a kind of pissy mood. So I explained the whole no solicitor. He goes, oh, I have an idea. I said, what? He goes, why don't you write a story and kill them? Said, Great idea. And so that, that was the birth of that, that book that I then made an adaptation into a screenplay and um, raised the money and shot a film, uh, which is still in worldwide release, which is really exciting for me. Oh, wow. as, as far as secrets, I've always had a fascination of World War II. And when I was younger, I always thought my dad wasn't dead. He was on this special mission, secret undercover and all that. And until I found letters in the attic, you know, to my mother saying, I'm sorry, you know, Gus is dead and all that. So I did a lot of research about what the Nazis were about and what D-Day was about and what some of the undercover work was. And I created this story that starts in Nazi Germany and comes to present day and becomes like a James Bond film. But it's, it has a lot of truth about um, psychotropics and uh, other chemicals that started in Nazi Germany and wound up getting approval in Congress with actual Nazis pitching it and nobody knowing they were Nazis. And there was a lot of... Um, uh, research done. So I, I wove some of that into uh, the fictitious story uh, without making a big deal of its truth. And it's a great read uh, uh, if you like that kind of thriller and excitement and James Bond stuff. Um, I've gotten so many wonderful people writing back saying this is a very cool read and it's an easy read. It's a nice sit on the beach read, you know, adventure. Well, I think all your books are kind of easy reads. But I, I think working in the field, right, you want to tell a good story. You want to direct a good story in the book as well. That's interesting you said that because I, I tend to write very visually. And people say, you know, you should turn this into a, a film. And I keep thinking, yeah, that's probably what I was drawn to in my mind in the first place. Um, I also just finished another book called The Myth, which defines how we got here and why we got here. Because as a little kid, I always felt this pulling and I never realized what it was or thought about it. And then one day I was watching Nat Geo or something and I was listening about how salmon swim up because they have such a, a need to go home. And I thought, oh my God, maybe that's some sort of alien DNA in me that wants to go home and it keeps pulling at me. So I created this other two-dimensional out of our sink uh, 
story about these two warring factions that wanted to find three planets in the solar system and see if they could cohabitate. So I created Earth, Mars, and Milana. And of course, those two planets got into a big war and destroyed each other. And I justified that the um, asteroid belt is one of the planets. And when two of my characters, uh, uh, Eviana and Adamius, turned out to be Adam and Eve at the end of the, of the, the story. And then now they had to, to uh, find their way with the uh, inhabitants of Earth because they can't, there's no way to get back home because everyone blew up everything. So. Uh, it's it's a really cool idea. So is that book out now or is it coming? No, I'm, st I'm looking for either a publisher or a lit literary agent. Oh, cool. So you yeah. have to keep me and keep me updated for that one. I will. I, I you know I love alien books. I don't know why because I always feel like I don't belong here as well. Like I'm just like I I'm supposed to be on some other planet and they're gonna come and get me one day, right? <laughs> Well, it, they're not going to get you. I, I don't know. I've never felt like I fit in, right? So I always feel like I'm just oddball. Uh, and I'm drawn to aliens. Like I always tell everybody, if you want the truth, watch Hollywood. Watch the movies because they're telling us stuff, right? <laughs> so how true is that, John, if, if we watch these movies? Like are they giving us insights to what's going on? With the movies? Yeah. Well, you can watch No Solicitors, I think, on Tubi. Uh, this, I mean, you can probably Google it, and it's it, for all I know, it might be on YouTube. I don't know, um, but it is it, all over the place. Um, uh, I'm doing a Christmas story called uh, Christmas Voices that I wrote an adaptation of one of my novels, and uh, you know we're fully ready to go, so we're out looking for investors. Um, I did another adaptation of a novel uh, from an author that um, is dealing with the blue zones. And if you don't know what those are, it's several places around the world, one of which is in Loma Vista, California, where people live an extended life and they've been trying to figure out why through DNA and all that. So she created this story where eight people were captured and kidnapped basically to extract uh, the DNA and figure out how they can uh, monopolize it and make money on it. And that's, it's a powerful thriller. And I'm pretty excited about that. Oh, wow. So when's that coming out? Well, we're in the budgeting stage of that one right now. We had, uh, I had written the story, and then after that, we did what's called a schedule, and uh, we detailed out all of the scenes in terms of what days get a shot on what days. And now we're at the stage where we have to do the budget. I'm, I'm old school, so I had to do a schedule before budget because I don't know how you budget something unless you know what you're shooting every day and what the equipment needs are and crew and all that. So it's a very realistic budget uh, that'll, that'll be um, uh, completed. Yeah, because I found a GoFundMe that you're doing for a Christmas, a Christmas classic. Is that the one you're talking about? Yeah, Christmas Voice. It's a GoFundMe. Yeah, we're we're slightly shy. We're, we're ten thousand dollars shy in order to present a scene to a group of investors that wants to see what we can do. Um, so, if anyone out there knows anyone that's looking for a tax write-off, uh, you can become a patron of the arts in a sense. And you know, it's end of the end of the year. So, if you need a tax write-off, even if it's five hundred dollars or a thousand. We're not asking for the whole 10,000 from one person. So uh, love any help anyone can afford. Yeah. See, I do my homework. I I, I got that over here. <laughs> and yeah. I was just like, oh, that's so cool. Uh, you also are the book Spirit. You did a script, Christmas Voices. So it's Christmas Voices with the Christmas classic? Uh, Christmas Voices is out of my own brain. Uh, it all started with my wife asking if I wanted to have some Charles Dickens porcelain things around the Christmas tree. So it started just really small and then we moved into the house and it got to be on the floor. It was about 10 feet long and then it got too big. So we built a four by eight platform and we put it up there and now <laughs> it got in my blood. So I rejigged the whole thing and I rebuilt it, the platform, because we have to stand on it in order to build it from the back forward. And it's five and a half feet wide and 22 feet long. And it takes wow. us nine weeks to build. Uh, you can go on Facebook or, or you can even Google uh, Callus Christmas Village and you can see what we do. Um, and it's all hand carved uh, mountains and trains and gondolas and skis. And uh, it's just one of those things that we've done since 1991 and have become known as one of the world's uh, largest display builders of Charles Dickens Department 56. Um, and we take it down because uh, every year is every other year that we were doing it. 
um, it never repeated. The, the, the layout was different. And so we took about an 11 year hiatus and two years ago we built it again and just fell in love with the whole process all over again. So we're, we're waiting because it's a boatload of work. So we're not going to do it every other year. It's, it's just every couple of more years, you know. Wow. So you're a big Christmas fan. Love it. Love it. So what, what is it about Christmas that you love, John? I think it's because everyone gets off their position and there's just so much love and joy and happiness and celebration. Now, there is frustration about shopping and all that. Now, for me, I was having like crazy mindset problems about shopping. So I started September and in September, August, September, October. And by the middle of November, all my Christmas shopping is usually done. And I could just walk around real happy and, you know, have a candy cane or anything I want. And I'm just very relaxed during the holidays instead of being all twisted in it. So that's a bit of advice for people. If you start early enough, you can just be relaxed about it and not panic. Oh, I got to get a gift. Well, I'll just buy that, you know, and then you're not really buying it from your heart. You're buying it yeah. from a fear and need. Um, but I just I love the, the pageantry. We um, <laughs> we decorated our house so bright when we first moved into this neighborhood. Nobody was decorating their houses outside. People were stopping by, taking pictures, and some of my friends were teasing me, saying, "You know, they're seeing this from outer space." You realize that, right? <laughs> <I> said, <laughs> well, what can I tell you? I love it. And inside, my wife and I are both nuts. We just decorate everything everywhere. And sometimes in July, we find little ornaments and stuff we miss taking down. We go, "Oh God." So, uh, yeah, we're, we're excited. We can't wait to start putting it back up. Well, you, you light up your house so bright so that the people, the planets that are looking for you can come and find you. <laughs> yeah, they're not going to capture us. This is a rescue mission. I want to be rescued. <clears throat> so, John, how many films have you made in your 50 years? Honestly, I don't know. I, re I really lost count. It's it's one of those things I just do it and then move on to the next one. I don't really think about it. Uh, I know I've done over two, three, four hundred projects in total. So besides filmmaking, you've also done like commercials and advertisement and that as well. Uh, I seen something with a battery. There's a picture with you with batteries. What what yeah. commercial was that for? That was for Fuji batteries. They called me and said. We don't have an agency. Would you be willing to write a story about it and, and film it for us? And I said, sure. So I came up with the idea and they proved it and off we went. Um, yeah, I did a lot of a uh, lot of commercials and uh, I was asked to be an agency producer in uh, several shoots, one of which I want a building and one I want a Clio for, excuse me, which are uh, commercial pre prestigious um, awards to win. So. Uh, it, it's just been a lot of fun. I, I don't go in thinking awards. I go in thinking, how can I make this the best piece that's possible? Yeah, I think you bring the heart in and you make the difference. That's what you do, John. Because uh, all the work that I looked at, the, and you know, uh, I was just like, wow, I didn't know John did this. Wow, John. <laughs> I was like, whoa, okay, he's all over. And it's important to get all over because you want to put your toes in every little thing, right? To get to know the industry as well. Yeah. Um, so is there any fields that you wouldn't work in? Uh, pornography. Uh, it's just not my thing. I don't want to, it's just something I don't do. I don't, look, if people want to watch and do it, it, it's fine. I have no judgment about it. It's just not for me. Yeah. So you've done all the other genres, John? Pretty much. I even shot a documentary in Russia. So that was pretty cool. That's the white gorilla, right? No, the white gorilla was um, a short that I took on uh, that I really liked the story. No, the, the one in um, in Russia was a documentary I was asked to, to direct uh, based on the Cold Wars and when uh, Reagan claimed that he brought down the Russian Empire. And my research and shooting all of the uh, top people in Russia, it turned out that he just took advantage of a moment in time where the Russian infrastructure was falling apart anyway. They, they were doomed and uh, they openly admitted it. So it was, uh, it was, it was kind of bittersweet listening to their stories going from communism to uh, democracy. Uh, clearly, I, I'd rather have democracy and some of the ways they told me that the Communist Party worked just didn't sit well with me. But having said that, I'm one of very few uh, Westerners that was taken into the taken into the vault 
and allowed to hold Stalin's communist card in his hand. And that just gave me chills when I looked at it. I went, this is Stalin, so it mackerel. So it was uh, quite an experience to, to do that. Wow. Yeah, I, I remember the white gorilla because I was reading on that. That's about the, the, the monkeys, right? The gorillas. No, this was about a boxer who... Uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. See, I, I did so much work on you, John, that I'm just like, oh, <laughs> my mind's all over, like, down over here. I'm, I, my brain is thinking gorillas like a monkey. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> well, it's easy, more. the white gorilla. You wouldn't make that assumption. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't know where Miss Liz's brain went very for a minute, guys. Um, yeah, you don't want to know. Various <laughs> <laughs> minds, you know. <laughs> right? You just never know. Uh, Miss Liz, whoop, it went over the head a little bit. Uh, <laughs> since we're on the whoop, let's just take it down another little twist here, John. And let's go back into lemons. Let's see if you you know where I'm going with this. Uh, I seen a post that you put on, I think in July, I believe, and you were holding a small lemon and a big lemon. Uh, do you want to tell me a little bit about those lemons? Sure. <laughs> well, you pick up some doozies, don't you? <laughs> uh, I told you, I, 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 I'm the loopy girl, right? I just go all over the place. <laughs> a friend of mine was moving to France and he had this two foot lemon tree in his, in a bucket. And he said, you want it? I said, Yeah. Why not? So I went in the backyard and I planted it. Now it's uh, about 10 feet tall and it just produces these lemons at the beginning of the season that are literally about this big. And when you have a store bought one about that big and you hold one that big, it's just amazing. A, a friend of mine gave Christine McVie from Fleetwood Mac a couple of the big ones and she wrote back and uh, told him to tell me that she's never tasted sweeter lemons and can she have more? I said, Got a ticket to the concert, <laughs> so um, I, they gave me they gave me a ticket to the concert. It wasn't I wasn't serious, but anyway. Uh, well, uh, see lemon, where the lemon takes you. It gives you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Talking about turning lemon into lemonade, right? <laughs> right. Uh, when I seen that, I was like, "Whoa, that's a big lemon there!" Like, uh, you know. And when you posted that, you were also posting a recipe for a lemon soup that you had shared with me, John. It's a uh, Greek soup called Avgo Lemono. And so I want I want to get that out there because I haven't made it yet. I have the recipe because John gave it to me. But John, what is, what is it about that soup that you love? It reminds me of my grandmother when uh, when I was a little kid. Um, we call grandmother Yaya in Greek. She would always go Ella the Johnny, Ella the Yanni, and that means come here, John. And she would always take me in the kitchen, and it'd be the big pot of alpha lemon being made, um, which she made from scratch. You know chicken broth came from the chicken, not a can. And uh, there was always a smaller pot on the stove. She goes, this, you take home for you only. This is just for you. I said, oh, thank you, Yai. And I'd give her a big kiss and I'd get home and the next morning there'd be about that much fat on the top, you know, and just come from the, the, the wonderful ingredients and stuff. And I'd pound it down and cook it up and stuff. And it, I guess that's what it is. It reminds me of my grandmother a lot. And it's, uh, if you're Greek, you know, our staple is lemon and lamb. So L&M, you know, lemon, lemon yeah. and lamb. And uh, it's uh, it's just fun. Even my kids now took the recipe and they're making it. So, Yeah, I was like, oh, a lemon soup. I've never heard of it. So I, then I had said, John, give me the recipe. I haven't made it yet because I'm scared to make it, John. Uh, well, you know, we can FaceTime one time and I'll take you through the whole thing in my kitchen. And we'll just oh, show well, you. Oh, look at that. There's just one little section that you have to let the soup cool down enough and then start warming up and you have to pour in the ingredients slowly or it'll curdle on you. So that's the tricky part. And so we can do FaceTime and I'll show you how to do it. Oh, well, that's awesome. Well, thank you for that, John. No See? problem. <laughs> John takes time to even show me how to cook. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only thing I was scared of when you gave me the recipe. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to curdle this. I'm going to curdle this. I, I, I don't know. Oh. Uh. Yeah. Once you, once you do it once, it's easy peasy. Yeah. So, uh, John, the last time you were on, I also got a recipe from you for Christmas cookies, I believe. Uh, that might have been my wife's recipe, not mine. Yeah, I think so. We were talking. See, I get recipes from John during tea time. <laughs> I got I'm a soup this to... time. Last time I had cookies. There was Christmas cookies or something that we talked about the last time. Because yeah, you were I on think... in November because it was close to Christmas. I know that. 
they, I think they're the white powdery ones. Those are the yes, ones. yes, those were yeah. the ones that we talked about. See, we yeah, talked no, about I do most of the cooking in the house because I love cooking and my wife can't stand it. And uh, there's always a joke, joke, a joke in our house. It's like, uh, uh, honey, we're having some guests over. Do you want to cook? And she goes, why? Don't you like them? I said, all right, I'll cook. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about you and your wife because you've been married 32 years, correct? Coming on 33 in October. So what's the secret? Truthfully, it it's going to sound really corny and pedestrian, but at times you have to have the uncomfortable conversations. And what we've learned is it's all about communicating. As hard as sometimes it is, you have to communicate. And you also have to know what the boundaries are. Like we have a deal that if in the middle of a communication or discussion, it gets too intense, we both can say, I need to table this because I'm getting really frustrated and I need to walk away and calm down for a bit. So we do that. And then one time we had an agreement where uh, Lindy could stop me and say, you know, I, I listened to you, but I don't want to respond. I want 24 hours at least to think about it so I can let it digest. And she, I did the same for her. And believe it or not, after 24 hours, my thinking process had changed completely from that night. And I'd go to her and say, you know, I was all set to do this, but I, I realized the things you were saying are really right. And um, I'm really glad we had the time to calm it down and, and work on it. The other part of it is, for us anyway, is we have two things. We have a husband and wife and we have friends. And sometimes one of us will say, put the marriage aside. I need to talk to my friend right now. And we started as friends and we still are friends uh, and we communicate. We share things uh, equally. There's no like who's running the roost, who's doing this. Now, when I say that, she loves vacuuming. I can't stand it. She loves laundry. I'd rather throw the clothes away and go buy new stuff. I love cooking. She doesn't want anything to do with it, but she'll clean up. So we, you know, and I do all the maintenance in the house too. So we found that all of the things that make us compatible, the other one doesn't like doing, and we do. We also love traveling. So when we get on a plane, we're like two kids, you know, don't you travel? We're getting out, you know, and we just explore the world and just have a great time together. And we just, for some reason, haven't lost that. And it's weird because people say, well, after 30 some odd years, how's the sex? And I say, you know, it's never going to be like when you first get together. It's impossible. So what you have to do is change your mindset. It's not about the thrill and the joy of opening each clothes and stuff, but you're making love to the history of your relationship. And that to me became more valuable than the sparks and fireworks and all that nonsense. Uh, and you, you feel a closeness spiritually with a human being. And so I think communication is really the, the key to it all. Well, I think healthy intimacy, right? And a lot of people think intimacy is just sex, right? Yeah. There, there's so much more than that. And we talked a little bit about that the last time as well, John. You know, yeah. building that bond and connection, you know, doesn't have to always be intercourse. There's other ways of, uh, you know, being close to each other you know, holding hands, having that conversation, pillow talking, you know, there's so much stuff that people don't understand about that connection of one on one, right? It's funny you said holding hands, because when we get in bed, we watch TV and we hold each other's hands. And, you know, after 30 years, people are saying, you got to be kidding me, you're really holding each other's hands? I said, yeah, we like holding hands. What's the big deal? Yeah, and it's, it's a touch. It's, it's subtle communication. Well, and that's the thing, right? Keeping that relationship together, connected, you know, not just through intercourse and sex, you know, there's intimacy. And I really talk about intimacy a lot on Tea Time because I want people out there and my listeners to really get connected, you know. Uh, right. People are coming in relationships and that's all they want to do, right? It's just, you know, take the clothes off and then boom, we're in love. Well, that's not what love's all about, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's so many different stages of love, guys, to build on that. And I think the other thing about it is that it's okay that you're going to have fights. And it's okay that you may not talk to each other for a day. But that doesn't mean your relationship's over. This new way of thinking like fast food, oh, it's not working, I'll just get another partner. You're just setting yourself up for failure every time. You know, you just have to get through it sometimes. And if you marry that person, you probably probably marry them because you love them. And that's what you need to keep coming back to. And 
yeah, the fights are not comfortable and I hate them. I hate it when we're fighting. It just doesn't sit well with me. And sometimes we'll look at you and start laughing. And go, what was that about? I said, I haven't got a clue. And you know, sometimes just the moon wobbled. I don't know what it is, but it's going to happen. But sometimes a fight is not even related to the relationship. It's just maybe you're having a bad day, you know, and something just triggered you or, you know, a word or a scent or a smell. And you're just like, ah, and you bottled it all up for a while. And then you're just like, oh, well, today's a good day to get you. Like, <laughs> 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 the crazy comes out <laughs> right yeah my has got crazy um so john i want to get into i want to calm the conversation down you gave me the word calm so we're going to calm it down uh okay. why the word calm to describe yourself as an individual well i find when i'm really crazy um with all these thoughts and like i get anxious and all that i have to find a way to calm myself down so one of my tools in my chest of the tools is I sit down and say, okay, you got these five things on your mind, write them down. So I write them down and say, now pick any one. I pick it and I said, how important is that in your life? What is the value to it? And I go through that process. Then I say, all right, on that list of, let's say five, what's the one, the least thing you want to do? And I'll say number three. I'll say, that's what you're doing first. And then I pick the second hardest until the last one, because when you get to the end of the list, the easy ones, you feel more calm and more relaxed. And then you just have to sit there and just take some deep breaths, calm yourself down, realize you've accomplished. Now, if you don't accomplish all five, that's no reason to get crazy because maybe one of them was get up on your roof and re-roof your house. Okay, well, that's not going to happen in a day. We know that. So um, it's an unrealistic goal setting thing. So it's I call the roofer. <laughs> me too. I was just using it as a, an example. But, um, it's it's just about identifying it again write the list and get it out of your head because if you keep it in your head you'll never get calm because our minds are very clever little son of a guns and they'll keep twisting it around and make you look in nine different directions at once and and you'll just your head will explode so calm down sometimes when i'm writing a novel or something i start getting really frustrated and i can feel it and i said i think it's time to walk away so i close it go outside sit down relax for a while breathe just take a walk, just clear your head and then go, ah. And then on the walk, some idea will hit me go, ah. I calmed down enough to listen to what I wanted in my brain as opposed to it ricocheting like a marble. So it helps. Well, I, I, you know, when I, you gave me the word calm, I was like, oh, this is going to be a conversation to get into because I was like, John, calm? <laughs> yeah, it sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? <laughs> I just like, oh, okay. I didn't know that side of you, John. <laughs> so, John, you gave me for your favorite color, you gave me the color white. And you're the first guest Purple. to give me. You Purple. gave me white. Did you not give me white? I, I don't think so. Well, I'm going to have to double check my notes. Okay, purple. You're going with purple? Well, I do, but I do like white too. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you gave me white. All right, let's go with white. I can, yeah. I can roll. Okay, so roll it. Roll, roll, roll the white. Well, let's see. White to me would represent the total spirituality. I mean, think about lightning. It's pure energy, right? And it's usually associated with a bright white light. So if you look at energy and it's white and pure, if you can surround yourself with white light, like we do in an airplane, my wife and I put a, a white light around the plane for protection. And we bless it, make sure everything's okay. Now, some people say, you think that works? I say, well, it hasn't crashed anytime soon, so I'm, I'm going to keep going with it until, uh, until the end of time. So I, I think there's a very spiritual side of, of white. Yeah. And you did give me purple the last time, and you gave me white this time, because I just checked. <laughs> <laughs> I told you it was purple. <laughs> So see, we got we got two different tea times here, right? We got season last season, and we have this season. So I got two different colors from you, John. At least I'm consistent, <laughs> right? <laughs> I was just like, maybe I got the wrong guest here. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, isn't this Bob? No, it's John. <laughs> Is this Bobby's world? <laughs> <laughs> So, John, if anybody would like to reach out to you or connect with you or have you as a guest on on, on their podcast, how could they reach you? Well, uh, you can go to johncallis.com. Um, it's my website. There's an email attached to it. Or you can just write me directly at johncallis at johncallis.com. Happy to talk to you. Uh, 
via email if you want a conversation. We can hop on the phone together. Uh, and yeah, sure, feel free. Awesome. Well, thank you again, John, for joining me. It was a pleasure all the time. We always have a good time together. Uh, for anybody that would like to know more about Miss Liz's Tea Times, check out my website at www.misslizesteatimes.com or check out Miss Liz's Tea Times on the YouTube and subscribe, ring that little doorbell. And I will be back Thursday with the closing guests for September. And tomorrow, the press release for October's lineup will be out as well. So check that out. We have two new countries coming in. So Miss Liz will be up to 72 different countries in five years. So that's the way that the tea spills in this house. And I just want everyone out there, the listeners, to know that I really appreciate your support. And without you guys, I could not do this. So thank you for tuning in and joining. And thank you for all your supports with your questions and comments and keeping Miss Liz moving forward. Um, and until then, I will see everybody Thursday, same time, same place. And we're going to serve TEA all over again and bring some more stories to the table. Thanks for joining tonight.